Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part six, the path of the Sufi from a history of secret societies by Archon de Raoul. Chapter five, the path of the Sufi. Twelve men sit on sheepskin rugs arranged in a circle on the floor of a large room in a country house in Sussex, England. They are of various ages. Each wears an orange robe over his Western clothes. They look towards the leader of the circle as the man opposite him remarks, we are all here, master. It is Thursday night and the meeting of Sufis is paralleled in a thousand lodges throughout Asia and Africa, and some in Europe and America as well. Softly, somewhere, a drum starts to beat. The leader, an olive-skinned man in his late thirties, holds up his right hand, the fingers extended. Love, blessings, the principles are five, meditation of the mind upon contact with the infinite, abstinence and restraint in order to produce the greater power, Generosity in all things, travel and movement, internal and external, belief in the unity of all power. All present incline their heads, intoning the Kabbalistical word Yahoo with something of the resonance of the Amen, which follows a prayer. We are at a Sufi meeting. Who are our companions? Three of them are Orientals, settled in Britain and carrying on various avocations. The fourth is a young architect who joined Sufism when he was a soldier in the Middle East. He knows some Arabic and has studied the mystical literature of the saints of the order. Another, rather older, is a lawyer who was recruited several years ago after reading an article on Sufism and putting an advertisement in a newspaper in an effort to trace any member of the cult who might be in Britain. Two further members are commercial men who have their own businesses. The rest are a mixture of employed people who have come straight from their London offices to this country place to spend the greater part of the night in their observances, and people of more or less independent means attracted to the message which the order offers. Why has the Oriental cult of Sufism an appeal for materialistic Westerners? What is it all about anyway? The people of the path believe, as the early anchorites of Arabia did, that a certain nobility of mind and purpose resides within every human being. This is the basis of what distinguishes them from their fellow men. This it is the task of the Sufi teacher to discover and develop in the individual. By the mental and physical methods of development which are practiced, it is believed that the human being finds his true place in life. Is Sufism a religion, a, a way of life, something like yoga, just a ramp? It is none of these things, and yet it is a secret cult whose members believe that it gives them something which they have unconsciously sought for years. In this respect, at least, it resembles a religion. It is rooted in the Persian and Arab literature of the mystics who sought communion with an eternal principle through the cultivation of ecstatic states. But at the same time, it is immensely practical. A Sufi is what a Westerner might call a hundred percenter. This attribute alone might enable a person to get ahead in his own sphere without much of the mind training and discipline which Sufism inculcates. If you are writing a letter, says the Sufi dictum, write it as if all the world will judge you by this letter alone. Yet the Sufis believe that if a person were to take their principles alone or piecemeal and applied them, this would result in an unbalanced personality. Sufism, they maintain, must be followed as a training system in its entirety. How does one become a Sufi? This is extraordinarily difficult. Sufis are not allowed to seek converts. This is because the disciple must obey every order of his superior, even unto death. If, the Sufis say, they were to recruit people by promising them worldly or even spiritual advancement, they would be accused of merely trying to get people into their power. In the countries where Sufism is deeply rooted, there is no lack of applicants. And of course, many young men and women are brought up on the path by their parents, for there is no celibacy in Sufism. Sufism enjoys a somewhat equivocal position in the countries of Islam, where it has its widest currency. This is because the orthodox religionists tend to frown upon a system which they believe is designed to set the individual free after an appropriate period of training from the restrictions of religion. At the same time, countless thousands of Sufi teachers' shrines are revered by the masses. Innumerable classical books have been composed by Sufis. Some of the greatest national heroes of Eastern lands belong to one or other of the four main orders of the Sufi way. That there is a supernatural element in Sufism cannot be denied. Members believe, and literature abounds with supposed examples of it, 
that the members of the higher degrees of initiation are capable of influencing the minds of men and even events in a totally inexplicable manner. And this belief is one which is as adamantly held by the Western members of the orders. My little daughter of six was dying of an incurable disease, one British Sufi told me, and I asked the master to bless her. He raised his hands, palms forwards towards me and said, Baraka Bashad, may the blessing be, and she was cured in three days. This exactly coincides with innumerable tales which are current in countries of the East where hopeless cases are taken from Western-style hospitals to Sufi mystics for the application of their baraka. This is the power which is passed from the sheikh, master, to his disciple, and from one generation of Sufis to another. If we return to our English Sufi meeting, we can see how another aspect of Sufism works. One member places his right hand to his neck as a signal to the master that he wants to speak. The sheikh inclines his head. I seek advice. I'm dealing in motor cars and other machinery. I have the choice of putting all my capital into a number of used cars or of building new garages. I have not enough capital to do both, which is the better alternative. The sheikh momentarily places the tips of his fingers over his eyes. I shall send the decision to you after this session, as soon as, as we have finished. The assistant sheikh makes a signal that he wishes to speak. We seek guidance upon the question of the headquarters of the order. Would you indicate whether we should try to buy the building in which we hold our contemplation retreats? The sheikh looks upwards. Let a fund be started. No money is to be borrowed. It is against the rule of the order. When there is sufficient money, buy. Now the sheikh starts to repeat certain syllables in rapid succession, and the sounds are taken up by the rest of the company. Ish yahu yahadi yahadi. These, roughly translated, mean love, O oh, he, O oh, guide, director. In common with the Arab Kabbalists, the Sufis believe that every sound contains power. The repetition of certain sounds with certain intentions causes a focus to be attained. The result of that focus is to cause the human mind to project power in accordance with the meaning of the sound. For operations of treatment of disease, for example, the company or individual will repeat, O oh, protector, Ya Hafiz, as many as 300,000 times. Material goods are increased by concentrating upon the invocation, Ya Mugni, O oh, enricher. This is not thought of as a form of magic because the relationship between the thing desired and the word is believed to be a cause and effect one. If you believe in anything strongly enough, in other words, it will happen. Adam Weishaupt, chief of the German Illuminati. Sufi, ceremonial, brass axe. The paraphernalia of ritual initiation societies, these tribesmen are southern Sudanese. A part of the evening is set aside for concentration upon various objectives of the order in this manner. Then, in ones and twos, the members carry out their own silent repetitions designed to liberate the innate faculties which their director believes should be developed. Added to the repetitions are physical exertions. The body may sway from side to side with the beat of the drum or the words intoned by the sheikh. Or the head may be nodded backwards and forwards while the Sufi carries out his exercises designed to cause him illumination in which he gains a glimpse of perfect fulfillment. Meanwhile, awaiting his turn, a candidate for initiation sits in an adjoining room, wondering what is in store for him. He is a young man, scarcely 20 years of age. He has been introduced to the path through what is considered to be the best of all ways of entry, through the desire to emulate. It is thought that a potential Sufi is destined for great things if he has noticed something unusual and impressive about a Sufi and asks him how he developed this gift, ability, or characteristic. We are in a Sufi lodge whose collective noun is the halka, or circle. The initiation varies slightly according to the order which is represented. In this Naqshbandi lodge of the order which is known as the painters, the intending members must be prepared to comply with the instructions and the means of spiritual development given him by the master, Murshid. This is contained in the rules for initiates, laid down by Ahmad Yasawi, one of the 13th century adepts and these rules are memorized by every intending member. One, I surrender myself to the direction of the Murshid, helpless in his hands as a corpse in the hands of those who lay it out, glad to do so because I know that this is the right way. 
Two, I will polish my mind in such a way as to follow the instructions which will develop my capacities to the utmost limit. Three, regarding the powers which are liberated in me, I will never make use of them, except for the good of humanity, knowing that such attempted adverse use would harm only me. Four, I will serve the Murshid, seeing in his personality that which will be my personality, and in his greatness, and in my greatness, the benefit of all, and the divine all power. Five, doubts and uncertainties are to be expected. These I will ignore after I've allowed myself to know why they exist. Six, I will practice loyalty and steadfastness unto death, and hereby endow both symbolically and, if asked, practically, the order in the person of my guide and Murshid, with all my property and all my expectations in this life. Seven, Utter silence of secrets is my oath, and I will show respect for those who are set up over me, without quibble. I am the friend of the friends of the Order and the Murshid who exemplifies it, the enemy of the enemies of the same. The youth has completed his military service, is now studying accountancy. His first contact with the Sufi was when he was working as a part-time assistant in a restaurant. Here he noticed a man among the customers who always seemed on top of every situation. His methods of discussion with the people who came into the place were so controlled, and his perception, especially of atmosphere, so profound, that I plucked up enough courage to ask him how one did it. It may have been because I had not yet acquired enough self-confidence, but I'm glad that I did it. The way to initiation, however, was devious. At more than one point, the youth thought that his mentor was more than half mad. He took him for long walks, telling him that one day he might tell him something of value, but that he would have to have patience. How much patience did he have? Sometimes, after the first meeting, he deliberately misconstrued something that the young man said and accused him of being stupid. Listening to the way in which he tested him for patience, tact, moral probity, and sheer endurance, one felt that there could be few who would stand the pace in Britain today, at any rate. I asked the sponsor whether this was the standard procedure. He laughed. Not exactly in that form. One goes by intuition, you know, old boy. Eventually, the youth was given a book containing references to Sufism to read, then questioned upon them. Finally, he was asked to write a complete account of his life to date, taking as long as he liked over it and writing it in the form and detail which seemed appropriate. Now he was brought to a meeting for his initiation. He had already been asked whether he was prepared to surrender his personal sovereignty to another person and had agreed to do so. The members of the circle are styled by various names which describe household or other offices. This is probably a survival of the time when most Sufis were organized into communities. There may be, for instance, the cupbearer, the cook, the groom, and the carpet layer. Other orders have the soldier, cavalier, emir, or the brother, nephew, uncle, and so on. In this particular case, the sword bearer, taken from the motif of a ruler's court, is the sponsor for our neophyte. He leaves the assembly, goes into the antechamber, and asks the candidate if he is ready. Upon being told that he is, he teaches him the secret sign of salutation of the order. This is the first identification signal learnt. He leads the youth back to the halka. At the entrance to the chamber, the newcomer removes his shoes and waits while the sword bearer walks to where the master sits. I bring a newcomer seeking the protection of the order. Protection and blessings be upon him. He is one who seeks admission to our path. He has washed his hands of life. He is reconciled to the submission to the chief of chiefs. He bows in salutation to the emir of emirs. He begs to say that he has completed his novitiate with naming himself. And now he seeks the admission to the company. Why does he not speak for himself? He is here to speak. Come forward then and take my hand. The candidate comes forward, bows before the murshid and kisses his hand. Afterwards, raising his own to his head, tips of the fingers of the right hand in the center of the forehead. Describe what you know of the rules for initiates. The candidate now recites the rules as already given. He pauses after each rule to be asked, do you swear? And replies, I swear. Upon which the master of the halka raises his hand and the other members in tone, ya hai, O living one. The disciple may now take his place in the circle and is handed his terracotta colored robe, a staff and a bowl. This is the regalia of the wandering dervish and serves to remind him of the dedication of the order to uniformity in outward appearance, the robe, work and authority, the staff, and inner and bodily nutriment, the bowl. There are many paths within the order which the initiate may take, 
All will depend upon what his natural bent is. What are his inner capabilities which will be developed by the training which he is to receive? Early in his training, which takes place primarily with a designated teacher from the circle, he is given the poem of the Sufi mystic Nadim to commit to memory. It purports to describe the false Sufi, who fears man, accuses, slanders, claims exclusive right, who preaches traveling not to disciples properly enrolled, who purports to explain the path through assemblies other than those of initiates, who denounces a father, son, uncle, or other relative, who panders to the desires of the raw, immature, in giving them promise of things that they may want, not the things which they must have. Many Sufis go through training courses, as they would be termed in the West, designed to bring out various characteristics which they are thought to need in order to have a balanced personality. If the newcomer is impetuous, he must learn calm. If irritable, he must be made forbearing. If ambitious, his ambition must be directed. It is more than likely that Sufism has influenced the modern schools of mysticism which are known in the West, as well as the monastic orders of the Middle Ages. Many writers have tried to show that Sufism arose from Gnosticism, from Egyptian religion, was influenced by Buddhism, yoga, Christianity, Mithraism, but no such effort has been wholly successful. The problem is that it is not enough to say that such and such a phenomenon or belief occurs in, say, Shintoism and also in Sufism. Hence, that a cause and effect relationship is to be deduced. What do the Sufis themselves say about their history? To them, Sufism is the blending of mind training with successful living, which comes in association with what, until recently, has generally been considered to be religious ecstasy. They do not, however, differentiate between one thing and the other. Mankind, they say, has certain capabilities, certain ideas, certain capacities for experience. These things are all related. The goal is the ideal man who shall use every aspect of his experience to be in the world and yet not of the world. These teachings have been passed down to the elect since the beginning of time. The modern phase and the fully documented one begins with Islam. 45 people calling themselves seekers banded together during the first year of the Prophet's mission in Mecca and called themselves companions of the shrine or temple. They devoted themselves to reflection and the improvement of their inner and outer selves. Their objective was to do good to others and to rise to the greatest heights of achievement of which man was capable. These people may have been drawn from a tribe in Arabia called the Bani Musa, who for centuries attended the Temple of Mecca and called themselves the servants of the temple. This temple today, called the Holy Temple, is the point towards which Muslims turn in prayer and to which they carry out their annual pilgrimage. Tradition has it that it was built by the first men and that it was rebuilt by Abraham. Those who believe in a secret doctrine within Islam state that the family of Abraham, who were traditional guardians of the temple in Mecca for time uncounted before Muhammad, had been taught the Sufi path and passed it on. Muhammad himself was of the lineage of Abraham through the Quraysh tribe, guardians of the temple at Mecca. His progeny are highly respected by the Sufis, who say that they alone are the true inheritors of the secret doctrine. Some historians say that the word Sufi is derived from the Arabic word Suf, wool, because Sufi is dressed in woolen cloth. Others that it is derived from the Greek Sophia, wisdom, and that the Sufis are the wise ones. Many Sufis deny this. If they had chosen the name because of the wool, they say, it would by their symbolism mean that they regarded themselves as sheep. As for wisdom, the title wise one is a low degree of initiation and could not be used as descriptive of the Sufi path as a whole. Members of the esoteric branches work out the meaning of the word by Kabbalistic numerology. S equals the earth, letter swad. U equals the perfect man, elevator of rank, letter W-I-U. F equals power, angels, letter F-A. I equals supporter, lord, letter Ya. This association of numbers runs the secret doctrine, totals 186. Which number can be split up by the Abjad notation to mean recompense for effort, power rising to success? Thus it will be seen that the Sufi Kabbalist believes that words and numbers have interchangeable meanings and that the name for the cult is based upon a mnemonic of its strivings. There are varying degrees of initiation in Sufism. Promotion from the one to another is through the decision of the teacher to whom one is attached. In the Bakhtashi order, which provided the Turkish Empire with the Janissaries, the organizational degrees are thus. One, 
Ashik devotee, who is a postulant but not fully initiated. Two, Muhib dedicated, who has been assigned a master. Three, Baba father, master of a halka. Four, Khalifa deputy, prior. In this order, the initiate must pass through a doorway composed of two pillars which curve and meet at the top. The entrance symbolizes entry into real knowledge and illumination. He must not touch the pillars or step on the threshold. The Bektashis consider that Ali, son-in-law of the Prophet and his fourth successor, passed down the inner wisdom of their initiation. The pillars commemorate those at the Temple of Mecca, Safa and Marwa, between which all pilgrims must pass. The attachment of the initiate to a teacher is considered to be a part of the training to enable him to overcome the restrictions of selfishness as a first stage. Part of his struggle as a Sufi is against the self, which he cannot remold at one blow. The fundamental principle of the cult is unity. Unity means that eventually somewhere all things are one, all thought, all matter, all power. It is not possible for a person to understand this, even though he may accept it as an intellectual postulate, until he has experienced it in mystical or ecstatic reverie. Detail from a Muslim coat of arms shows heraldic eagle bearing Sufi octagonal calligraphic motto on its breast. Arms of the princes of Pagman, hereditary Sufi chiefs. Sainthood or illumination is the stage of perfection of the Sufi when he becomes identified with all power and all being. Ordinary Islam does not officially take cognizance of saints, yet the myriad popular tombs and places of pilgrimage throughout the world of Islam are almost without exception those of Sufis. How secret is Sufism? This is something which is very difficult to answer. In the first place, the orders require initiation, passwords and signs. Secondly, some of their esoteric literature is hard to understand and has its own technical terminology. Yet on the other hand, it is a canon of belief that a Sufi does not progress merely by passing through degrees and initiations. The blessing, Baraka, sometimes called power, must come upon him. If this is so, and the Baraka is passed on from another Sufi, the conclusion is that there should be no need for secrecy because no outsider could experience what the Sufis are undergoing in their raptures. Uh, the answer to this given by Sufis themselves is that atmosphere plays a part in the cultivation of enlightenment. Strangers are a barrier and also a superfluity. Sufism is not for an audience. Again, the word secret is used in a special sense. It refers to one or more of the inner experiences of the mind and not to the mere possession of formal knowledge. In this way, Sufism differs from those schools of initiation which used to hold actual secrets, such as those of philosophy or how to work metals or even how one could supposedly control spirits. The disciplines of the orders are six in number and it depends upon his teacher as to which one is to be used by which Sufi. First comes traditional ritual worship, then recitation of the Quran. After that, the repetition of certain formulas, now striving or effort for a goal, then physical exercises, breath control and the like, and finally contemplation on individual themes, then on complicated ones. Sufis are to be found in every department of life because few of them practice retirement from the world except for short periods of reflection. Architecture and the arts are traditionally represented by a greater number of them than otherwise. But there are military Sufis, commercial Sufis, teachers, travelers, contemplatives, healers, and the rest. Some of them combine more than one attribute. Some of them are women. And Rabia, one of the greatest ecstatics of the East, was a Sufi mystic. She, like others before and after her, stresses the fact that the stage of mystical illumination, release and understanding of the meaning of life, is only the first of two halves. The Sufis say that after reaching that stage, unlike any other mystical school on record, the Sufi must return to the world and must put his experiences into practice. Uh, this is the point at which his infallibility is first encountered. It is believed that he is now endowed with a perception far greater than that of ordinary men and women, and that he is rightly guided. We'll now always take the course, hold the opinion, or follow the path which is for the best. Uh, this is because he is in harmony with the pattern of life which is almost all hidden to those who have not been through his training. There are many traditional centers of Sufism and all the major orders trace their spiritual pedigree through dozens of teachers. Heredity is also acknowledged in the transmission of the law. The Musa Kazim family, who have ruled Pagman in Afghanistan for seven centuries, are directly descended from Muhammad and are the traditional heads of the Naqshbandi order. They are also said by some to preserve a special training system which is granted only to a very few initiates. 
It is by means of this system that they have been able to produce an apparently endless succession of princes, military leaders, savants, and successful men in many walks of life. It is from this family, by tradition, that the office of Caliph of all Islam is to be filled. Figure C, Sufi tree of life emblem, meaning wisdom. On the whole, the effect of Sufism upon society has been creative and wholesome. Sufis do not suffer from fanaticism, are not connected with magic, though they are thought to have special extra-normal powers, and hold to the principle of honor and effort to an astonishing extent. Alone among what may be termed secret cults, they have not been successfully challenged with heterodox activities. And the phrase for the word of a Sufi is proverbial. Attempts have been made to popularize Sufism in the West in a similar manner to that which is used with odd cults of personality. But, with the exception of the schools which have been set up on an experimental basis, the society Sufism has never caught on. It is probable that the message is not susceptible to popularization on a theoretical basis alone, just as the English translations of Sufi literature by erudite non-initiates are held by Sufis to be faulty to a degree, and the people who are real Sufis must, by definition, work and teach as Sufis, which is a slow and arduous path. In the West, if not in the East, there are very few shining examples of Sufi personalities to attract large followings. But the path of the Sufi is likely to exercise a fascination over men's minds for many a year yet, and its influence in the West is undoubtedly increasing. Uh, thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.